This program is brought to you with support from the U.S. EPA. We're here to present the EFC Network Podcast. The Environmental Finance Center Network is a partnership of 12 centers serving 10 EPA regions. The EFCN provides training and technical assistance to small water and wastewater systems. This podcast series has been designed to help system personnel improve technical, managerial, and financial capacity of the utilities and communities they serve. Hello and welcome to our podcast today. My name is Tanya Bronlewy. I work as the director of the Environmental Finance Center at Wichita State University. And joining me today is Dr. Deanne Presley. She is a certified professional soil scientist who works in the Department of Agronomy at Kansas State University. She gets to work with agriculture agricultural producers to find ways to keep soil healthy and on the farm fields. She helps farmers find ways to compost, develop biofuels, reduce tillage, increase residue, rotate crops, and prevent erosion. One of the things she often gets to work with are lagoons and septic systems. So today we're going to talk about those lagoon and septic systems. And if you haven't thought a lot about where your wastewater or your poo goes, um, that is what we're talking about today. A lot of folks in the United States don't live in communities where they have municipal or city uh, wastewater removal. So when you live in a place like that, you get to have a lagoon or septic system and take care of your any water that goes down your uh, from your washing machines, goes down the drain in your shower, gets flushed away uh, in your bathroom visits. And it's an important part of making sure that we are protecting the environment where we live right on site. Um, if your wastewater isn't handled properly, we can it can cause disease for your family, neighbors, the local plants and wildlife, the nearby waterways, and communities downstream. So it's really important that we take good care of our wastewater so that it can get recycled back into the water cycle. Um, Deanne, I just want to welcome you, say thank you for joining us today to talk a little bit about poo. Thanks for having me. It is actually one of my favorite topics because I say if it's one of those, it's just like your drinking water. Either way, drinking water and wastewater, they're probably the two most important decisions a homeowner has to figure out when either building a new home or looking to purchase a home. What kind of, you know, what ability do we have to get drinking water and where does our wastewater go? How do, do we have to think about that? Do we have to upgrade a system or build a new system? That's where soil science comes in and it's a really important decision. Right. Is there any history about wastewater treatment? Have we always, you know, use these types of systems or how did wastewater treatment become part of what we need to think about as homeowners? So I'm not sure when, you know, some of the first wastewater systems were ever developed, but I can tell you this. I read an article once. It just came across a news feed and it talked about the 10 most important medical, you know, um, breakthroughs that we've had as humans. And number one was the fact that we figured out that keeping our wastewater, you know, kind of not instead of just letting it go everywhere, but developing wastewater systems was the most important medical advancement in human history. And I thought that was fascinating. I had no idea when I read that article that that's what it was going to say, but it was, you know, and think about vaccines, you know, those are impressive too, right? But put keeping your, figuring out that keeping our wastewater separate of our drinking water or our food prep areas, things like that is, um, it's one of the most important things you can do to stay healthy. I just thought that was fascinating. I love that. Yes. Uh, so if say I buy a house, and mm -hmm. I don't get to get connected to my municipal wastewater, you know, system. What are the different ways that I could take care of my wastewater safely for my home? Yeah, that is a, a good way to put it. So let's say that you're shopping for a house and you are, you go and you go to visit that site for the first time, you know, go to the either, let's say it's a, Let's, there's two options here. Let's say that you're thinking, oh, I'll build a new house. Okay, that's one set of decisions. But let's say that you go look at a home. I did that myself a, you know, a few years back. I went to look at several homes, went to visit them with realtors. And I would say, okay, is this on the municipal wastewater system? And if they'd say no, I'd say, okay, can we look at the wastewater system? Is this on a lagoon or is this on something that goes underground? So we typically call those a septic system or another word for that is an on-site wastewater system. And great. So if it's a 
lagoon, we're going to see that. That's going to look like a pond, you know, some kind of pond in the state of Kansas we require a fence around it. But in other states, I'm not sure what the law about a fence is. But anyway, in the state of Kansas, it's going to be a pond with a fence. Um, and it was usually square, you know, might be 30 feet by 30 feet or 45 feet by 45 feet, something like that. Everything is size based on the size of the house because and we figure on how many people might live in the house but anyway a lagoon is going to look like that it's literally going to look like a pond of some kind not the kind you'd want to swim in but you know it's going to be a place where water the wastewater goes and it um will evaporate that's the main way that we dissipate the water so there's there's figures that can be used to estimate how many gallons per, per, of water um, a household uses per day or a person uses per day we actually um, a, a guideline that's used in design often says that you know, on average a person uses about 75 gallons of water per day but that varies quite a bit with you know how old you are or you know if you've got a bunch of kids at home and you're doing a bunch of laundry or if you had something like a home business like a daycare or something there's going to be some variables in there but then the other type of system is the type that's below ground so it's it where you have a your water comes out of the house into a septic tank below ground you know and that's buried so there'll be some kind of lid that you know um some kind of cover that you can get to to access that tank. Those tanks need to be maintained um, every so often, need to have the solids pumped out and be inspected to make sure that no pipes are broken or things like that. And from the septic tank, then the water gets distributed into some lines that go into the ground to let the water then be dispersed into the soil. Um, and then it is treated. So the water that leaves the septic tank, we call that effluent. It has stuff in it. You know, it could have bacteria. It could have nutrients such as nitrogen or phosphorus. Those are common things in wastewater. And then the plants that grow over the wastewater system, usually grass, but it could be other ornamental things. We don't recommend trees, but you know, grass or ornamentals are the best things to grow on top of the wastewater lines. And though, so through the summer, they're using water and nutrients as the plants grow. And um, so there's evaporation and transpiration happening. And in the winter time, there's just usually evaporation only happening. But that's how the water is treated. So it re-enters the hydrologic cycle. If you think about of course, you evaporate water, it goes into the sky. Eventually you get, you know, rain and the water comes back down. Um, or it could re by at, in the soil, we could have movement down and we could have that water eventually rejoin, you know, a water table. But the key is to design it right. And that's kind of where I come in, not so much on the design, but choosing the right soils to put the system in so that it's like Goldilocks. We don't want the water to move too slow through the soil because then it'll pond and that's not good. Or we don't want it to just speed right through the soil. If we put it right into a really coarse sand or something, it could rejoin a water table too fast. So that's sort of the principles of how they work. Two ways, either the pond way, what we call a lagoon, or the in the ground way, which we call a septic system or an on-site wastewater system. And so these systems are, um, there's pros and cons. There's totally pros and cons of different systems. And if you're saying, well, why would a homeowner pick a certain one? Well, usually it's the soil of that lot that dictates the right kind of system for that site. Also, probably the checkbook. You know, there are sometimes if somebody says, I don't want to look at a lagoon, well, we can do something different, but that's going to usually cost a lot more. And do we have the space? And does the homeowners association allow, you know, um, a different kind of system? So there's more than one thing. I shouldn't I shouldn't say it's only soils, but soils are probably the most important driving factor. How do I figure out what kind of soil I have? Would is that something the person that would like if I'm moving into a new house? Is that something the the wastewater engineer would come in and and do for me or do I need to know that before I make the call to someone who could build a lagoon or a septic? Yeah. That's a good question. So let's say that you are looking at a lot that has nothing on it. So in this case it is a absolutely brand new system. So what I or new new there's nothing there. So let's say 
hypothetically you have a space in mind, um, you can actually use some tools online. So there's a website called Web Soil Survey that is operated by the USDA, so United States Department of Ag, Natural Resources Conservation Service that holds all of the soil maps for the whole US. So as long as you're building in the US, you could find some soil information for your site. It is a, a it's like studying the game film for another team, right? So if you're going to go play another football team or another volleyball team or whatever, you might watch the film ahead of time to figure out what they usually do. It's like that with web soil survey. So if I look at the soils that are mapped there at that site, one of the things that you can do on that website is say, well, what are the suitabilities for a wastewater system? So there's actually suitabilities for lagoons, and you could see what the ratings are for the soils, or suitability for a a septic system with lateral fields under the soil. And um, those are great tools. But just like a game film from a team that when you when you watch a game film from another school or when, when they play somebody else, that doesn't say that those are the same things that you're going to see when you play that school, right? Or play that team. And so the reason I use that analogy is because we can't use those as our only tool we still have to go look at the soils on the site because they were mapped in a broad way um, and we need to be a little more specific. So for example, if you have a five acre lot or a two acre lot or a one acre lot and you have to have a on-site wastewater system because you're not on a municipal system, then we need to think about, okay, where's the house gonna go? Where's the driveway gonna go? Where are other important things like a, a shed or a pool gonna go? Um, and then we also look around this space and say, okay, having all those things in mind, where and maybe there's a well also, there's a bunch of things, right? But we have to think about what, where are, what are the soils like? And are they, can I find a, maybe, a, maybe the whole thing was mapped and it says it's all severe. That's pretty common, to be honest. Uh, county I live in, for example, I look at that, there's a lot of my county I live in that's a severe for a septic system. But that doesn't mean that we don't have them. It just means that we have to pick the very best spot on a, that field or on that lot and then design the right system for that spot. And maybe it costs more than we want it to, but we can do it. Um, anything is possible with, with some engineering and maybe with some money to pay for it. But um, the point is, is that those soil, those soil resources are out there on Web Soil Survey. You can totally get an idea of what's there. And then the next step is what should happen is um, you buy a lot or you're thinking about a lot. In fact, this just happened not that long ago. I know of a homeowner that saw a lot that they wanted, that they wanted to buy. They wanted this land and they talked to the wastewater person. So in this case, um, the county sanitarian or the environmental health professional for that county, they talked to the county person and said, hey, um, would you come look at this property and see what kind of, tell me what kind of system I could have and where I could put it? They did that before they even bought the land. And I'm like, if everybody did that, that would be great. <laughs> and so they did that. Because sometimes you'll come to assist, you know, come up to a situation where what we don't want to have happen is this. What if somebody buys a small lot and they put the house there and then there's no other good soil to put the system in? Or what if the best soil for the system is uphill of the house? Well, then they have to go against gravity. So they have to have a pump. A pump requires electricity. And it just, it's not that it's, those things are done. They're done all the time. But, you know, if they could, maybe if they'd had their druthers, you know, if they could have a do over, maybe they'd have switched that and they'd had the house more uphill and the system downhill. Again, then if you could have, we'd prefer things to run off of gravity than off of a pump that requires electricity, just because it's easier, doesn't, gravity doesn't fail ever, I don't think. Um, and so those are some of the things. It's sort of like a, oh, it's that Franklin Covey thing book, right? Begin with the end in mind. It's kind of like that. If you begin with the end in mind, it's usually cheaper and there's way less heartache <laughs> yeah. for sure. It sounds like we have, we should be proactive when we're thinking about house building and yeah. And yeah. Think about the you're... things that aren't as exciting. Like we re, when I, you know, think about, oh, building a house, I want to design the house and all the you know, maybe the garage or what the yard will look like. And I don't think about my wastewater as a key thing that I want to start planning for, but it should maybe be the first thing I think about. I think so, to be honest. And, and that I, again, I'm biased because of course, this is one of the things I think about a lot, but if you can have a water supply figured out, 
a good water supply to do, you know, enough water supply and have your, where your wastewater is going to go. Those are just two good decisions to make really upfront that then again, they'll, they'll cost you less money in the end so that you do have more money to spend on the fun stuff like your kitchen or <laughs> huge right. basement or whatever the thing is that makes you happy. You know, so yeah. that, that's what I think. I have seen people spend a lot of money on both of those things, water supply and a septic system, you know, more than you would think you possible. And you're just like, well, yep, those are necessary things that we have to have. So in general, if, if we find the perfect lot and is there, and we have soils that work for what we're thinking of, or is, is there a cost difference between like a septic system and a lagoon or, um, you know, is one much cheaper than the other one or less expensive? And then maintenance too, like does one more or less maintenance than the other as we're thinking about these two different options? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those are good questions. So if you are, first I'll say this, um, lagoons we associate with clayey soils. So we have to have um, just, the, if you were gonna make a pond, it'd be the same sort of thing, right? Lagoon or pond, either way, we wanna have a clayey soil. So if you don't have a clayey soil, then a lagoon is not an option for you anyway. I mean, you'd have to bring in clay and line it because they get dug fairly deep, right? So let's say you were shallow to bedrock. That's just not gonna be the system for you. Uh, I think the um, I think the bottom of the lagoon is somewhere around seven feet above the surface, you know, the ground level. So you'd have to have at least seven or maybe even 10. I know they over excavate so that they can make sure. Sometimes another thing I deal with is ponds that won't hold water too. And a lot of times it's because they just didn't have enough clay or they got too close to some bedrock, some broken up bedrock and thought they had enough clay or thought they relined with enough clay and just didn't. And then they got to drain the pond now it's you know pretty mucky and then they got to go in and do that work over again it's definitely not fun <laughs> so similar with a lagoon a lagoon is going to be a choice when we have plenty of clay so there are times where it could be a lagoon or an, an on-ground or an on-site system so let's say that's the choice where it's oh the the wastewater professional um for the county says, yeah, I think it could be, it could be this one or this one. Um, it could be this. So here's an example. Let's take a five bedroom house, four bedroom house, three bedroom house, doesn't really matter. Let's take with four bedroom house as just a starting point though. Um, four bedroom house, we would say in Kansas that um, we would estimate that eight people would be the max occupancy of that house. We usually say two people per bedroom. And uh, you're probably thinking, well, that's kind of high. How many people have eight people? Well, we do have a lot of four bedroom houses. And if you think about a wastewater system, is there any point in the year when there would be eight people in the house? Yeah, Christmas, holidays, things like that. So there are times um, and then the other thing is, is there might be times in your life when you have a bunch of people in the house. Maybe at some point there's a bunch of young kids at home and then they grow up and move away. But if the house is sold, then to somebody with those young kids again. So that's why we always design for max, max occupancy. So there, people don't get a choice in the matter. If they're like, yeah, but there's only two of us. Well, we don't care <laughs> because if the house is sold, it could be eight people then quite easily. So you take four bedrooms and if each person uses... Um, um, 75 gallons of water per person per day. So eight people times 75. That's how we size things. So now that we know that, then we know how to size the either the lagoon or size the wastewater system. So let's say that your soil has not a ton of clay, but some clay. So if I was to look at a soil texture triangle, like a silty clay loam might be a good example of this. A silty clay loam or a clay loam are soils that have some clay. They're not overwhelming in clay. So you could put a wastewater system in them, but the more clay you have, and if you wanna put a wastewater system below ground, that means you're gonna have more linear feet. So maybe you'd have to have 600 or 800 or 1,000 linear feet below ground. Well, then that is gonna cost more. So that's where once, if you get, a, if your wastewater professional for your county says, you know, you are in a situation where a lagoon would work, but also a way, an in-ground system would work, you'd have to have this many linear feet, then that's where you would go and approach a person who constructs wastewater systems and say, okay, so the, 
you know, and sometimes this might be handled by the contractor building your home too. But if you're, you know, wanting to really have all this information and understand it, you know, talk to the person creating the wastewater system, go get some quotes. I think some quotes from two to three reputable designer or your wastewater installers is a very good approach. Because we also, just like, uh, just like anybody else, they'll have their preferred ways of doing things. And so see what they say for prices. So this is sort of one of those uh, cost benefit analysis things. Um, if you have to have a big linear footage because you're kind of high in clay, then that's where a lagoon is probably going to be cheaper. But if you just have the world's most perfect silt loam soil, then you should definitely, a silt loam has less clay. It um, allows water to go through at just right. It's like a Goldilocks type um, texture. So the water doesn't move through too fast. Doesn't water, water doesn't sit there too long. It's just right. Then a silt, if you have a silt loam soil, then it's going to be a no-brainer, and your county professional will tell you the same thing. Yep, you should do an in-the-ground system, a lateral field. Your water is going to go in beautifully because you wouldn't have enough clay to put in a lagoon. So there are times where a lagoon might be the only good option if you have a lot of clay, but there's times when it could be either one, and there's times when a lateral field is by far the best option. It is that site-specific, to be honest with you. That's really interesting that, yeah, it's so specific to each location. So even if maybe my neighbor has one type of system and it costs this much money, my lot could be totally different. It really could, especially if there's some topography differences. Like if you're on one big flat plane, you still could have those differences. But for sure, if your neighbor is uphill or downhill of you, there there's a really good chance that your soils could be quite different. Um, I've seen that happen. I, there's a field that I did an agricultural experiment on and I laid it out for plots, you know, so we had long straight rows and we added, it was a gypsum treatment or gypsum experiments. So we did these experiments in long strips and then I soil sampled at the end of the experiment and was horrified to see that on one side of the field I had sand over clay and by the time I get, drove a quarter mile with my soil sampling rig, I had clay over sand and I was like, oh, I had no idea. So if you're in a flat area, you can still have big variability that's just just not visible to the naked eye. So you got to dig a hole um, to really get that full picture. But yeah, soils are amazing in that way. They're extremely variable. Yeah, I think soil is so interesting. And I don't think pe people think about it enough because, yeah, it really is fun to know what's happening underneath our feet. Yeah, I love to show people how variable it is. Is there, so I've heard a couple, so some folks with septic tanks, I know that there are potentially some things you can, people recommend putting in your tanks that help the process a little bit more. It's like a maintenance thing for your lagoon or septic system. And then uh, lagoons, I know, take a little bit of maintenance, like with mowing. Is there like a dredging thing that needs to happen with lagoons um, for folks? Yeah that may already have systems or moving into a system that's already there, what are some of those maintenance considerations we need to think about? That's a good question. Maintenance is a big piece of a wastewater system. Um, it's just like anything else that you own, the better you take care of it, the longer it's gonna last. We hope that whenever we design a wastewater system, we want it to last at least 30 years. And there's definitely systems that are 50 years old or more that are still functioning and have not needed replaced because people have done some maintenance. So first, let's talk about the septic tank. Um, not, I, I don't think every lagoon has a septic tank in front of it. Now, if it does, that's great. So the septic tank's job is basically to capture solids and have some mean red, there's like, you know, the water will sit there in that tank for, it depends how much water you're using, but let's say a couple of days. And so there's some things that are happening. Settling happens. So solid settles to the bottom, fat soils and greases rise to the top. And then the, where, the way the pipe on the other side is set up, the outlet pipe is so that the, basically the water that's going, the effluent that leaves that septic tank and then travels to either the lagoon or the lateral system for an in-ground system is going to be somewhat treated, meaning that it's still got all kinds of things dissolved in it. You would never want to drink it, but it doesn't have the fat, soils, and grease. And it doesn't have the solids. Either one of those things, if they make it into your into your um, lagoon or into your in-ground lateral system, reduce the life of the system. So 
let's start off with uh, lagoons and maintenance. Uh, so the biggest things with lagoons is um, mate as mowing so mowing and controlling trees uh, we don't want to have trees start growing around there so if you see little trees start coming i i actually have a lagoon at my house so we have to mow and i um i've burned to i've burned to like kill some little trees because mine is kind of close to some other trees so not too close but close enough that tr seeds from trees do get dropped there either probably from the wind or from birds things like that so keeping trees from getting going and the other thing is aquatic plants so whether that's like some aquatic plant that floats across the top or do not let um you know uh cattail start growing so i had a few cattails start growing one year and it's like you take your eye off it for five minutes and you come back and they're just almost taking over the whole thing so i had to do some work to remove cattails and that is not a fun project at all so that's one of those things just keep that mode trimmed up cattails start growing you know there are say uh, k-state research and extension pub on um, publication on aquatic plants and their control and that's what we use we look at that see what herbicides we can use or could we if they're just on the edge could we pull them this is you do not want to fall into a lagoon that's why a fence is required so this is one of those things that safety first um, do not do this project alone you know I would make sure in the case of like when I've worked on mine, I've make sure I make sure that my husband and my children know where I am. So if I were to slip and fall, it's it's muddy, you know, it's slippery. So that's again why I'm never going to let, you know, if I see one cattail out there, I'm either going to go pull it or spray it with a little sprayer, you know, from a little distance and get that out of there. So I'd say that's your main maintenance with the lagoon, really. Now, if the lagoon did start to, um, I guess one of the ways it could, you could eventually have it felt like, but if a lagoon had been used for 30, 40, 50 years, and it started to seem like it was really full of sediment that could be dug out, we dig out ponds, you know, if they've caught a lot of sediment, a lagoon is not designed to be catching a lot of sediment, though a pond is different in that they're usually catching, they're catching runoff water from down a slope, so they need cleaned out more. A lagoon doesn't need cleaning out near as often, I'll put it that way. So then let's go to like the maintenance for um, an in-ground system. So something with lateral fields. I haven't mentioned drip systems. We have drip systems in our state. Mound systems exist as well. Um, those are all, those are used in specialty situations where a drip situation is when maybe you've got kind of shallow soils. So if you've got shallow to bedrock or a drip system can also be used on for a really irregular sized lot. So think of maybe, maybe a lake home where you've got very little space between the home and the lake a drip system could be a good thing to kind of put in like spaghetti kind of every which way around that lot to keep it you know as a way to deal with the wastewater so um yeah so there's different kinds of systems um but let me say this so all of those systems have a septic tank so the septic tank needs to be pumped septic tanks catch sediment and every household is different in terms of what they're putting down the drain and how much they're putting down the drain so um, there is no such thing as normal or one size fits all. And so sometimes if we're trying to figure out problems with the septic system, like there's questionnaires you can find online for things you can just discuss with the homeowner. Like, uh, do you have any hobbies? You know, maybe the hobbies would help explain um, if there's maybe chemicals going down the drain that maybe in hindsight we shouldn't put down the drain or maybe um, there's a lot of sediment going down the drain. Um, so those are some, some questions to ask. So every system is going to have some solids that it's catching. And also I mentioned those fat soils and greases. I think everybody knows, you know, putting a bunch of grease down your septic system is eventually going to be, it's going to be putting down your drain. It's just eventually going to be hard on your drains, but it's also hard on your septic system. If we um, end up with a lot of grease ending up getting pushed out into the lateral field, it'll literally close off a lot of those pores. We're hoping the soil structure and the pores in the soil and also the microbes that live in soil are going to be breaking things down. But if we cover, put a bunch of sediment into the system or put a bunch of grease into the system, if it makes it through the tank and out into those lateral fields, it'll shorten the life. But if the tank is functioning, that means it has those three layers. It's kind of a fat oil grease layer, the clear effluent layer, and this, the sediment layer. Over time, let's say five years passes. If you haven't pumped your tank in five years, it might be a good thing to say, hey, let's pump our tank. Let's pay a 
a person who maintains wastewater systems, look in the phone book or ask your neighbors and say, who's good, you know, um, but look around and get that maintained and ask them to come and they'll come and they'll take the lid off and they'll maybe they'll have to move a little soil to get to the lid or something, but they'll take the lid. They will pump out those solids and they will basically clean the tank and inspect the pipes coming in, pipes going out. They'll let you know if something's cracked um, and, you know, and then they'll also, usually that's who you can ask for a quote to say, well, what would it take to repair this? What would it take to get it up and going again? These things also happen during a property transfer. So for anybody who's thinking, oh, I might be selling my home or in a year or helping a family member sell a home in a few years or something, these are also things that um, sometimes can hold up a property transfer. So if you're like, okay, um, you know, the person who buys the house is going to get a home inspection. So they'll want this done. They'll want the tank pumped and inspected by a professional. And then if you find out, oh, well, it's cracked, we have to replace the whole tank or, oh, this pipe is cracked, we have to replace this pipe. You know, these are times that sometimes if you're trying to sell a home really fast or, you know, the person wants a really quick closing or something, well, this have to get dealt with. They have to get scheduled. They, you know, maybe the weather will hold you up. These are things that are just good to do on some kind of, you know, routine. Um, I remember I counseled somebody to, yeah, you should get your tank pumped if it hadn't been done in a long time. And so they, they did it and they got their tank pumped. And then they had, they came and told me, they were like, my tank looked amazing. I didn't have too many sediments. I was like, well, good. Now, you know, so now, you know, if it's maybe if, if it had been five years since that had happened now, maybe next time you could stretch it out to seven, cause you were doing a good job. You don't, you, they weren't putting too much stuff that you, they didn't want into their tank. Um, another thing I do get asked about sometimes is additives. Should we put additives into our septic tank? And the, there, you know, there's different products you can buy that say, oh, it'll keep your tank clean or whatever. Well, the one thing I'll say about that is that most people don't need additives. Most people, um, this process of the, the fat soils and grease coming to the top and effluent and then the sediment settling out, for most people that happens in a very normal manner. There's an exception though. So there are times when that those layers can get disrupted. And one thing that disrupts them is if a person is using a lot of cleaning products, and I mean not I'm not talking like, you know, normal clean your house once a week kind of thing. No, like if somebody's using really strong cleaning chemicals. Well, I didn't explain this yet, but the reason we have those three layers in the tank, the fats, oils, and grease, the effluent in the middle, and the solids on the bottom is because of microbes. We have, microbes are amazing things, and a, so, a septic tank is full of things, <laughs> full of these. So those microbes are doing a lot of decomposition of, for example, we all know we contain fecal coliform bacteria, right? We contain fecal coliform bacteria just in our gut. So when we excrete that into our wastewater system, there's fecal coliform bacteria that enter the septic tank. And then there's other bacteria that eat them doing a really wonderful service. And that breakdown that all that life happening in that tank is what really creates those layers, those three layers. So if we going back to cleaning solutions, um, those things can disrupt those layers. And if you disrupt those layers, then you're putting sediment and potentially fat soils and greases out into your lateral field, which as I said, is not what you want. We wanna keep the soil open and free, nice and porous, not having all the pores closed off by other things we don't want. So one of my biggest pieces of advice is to have a maintenance routine. So if you're not comfortable with that maintenance routine yourself, or you have no idea what that should be because you just bought a house and nobody told you, I would consult with a person who does this type of work as a professional. So a person who either installs and or maintains wastewater systems could look at your system and say, this is what you would need to do. Maybe you have a filter and this filter needs pulled out every so often. And they could, if you said, how often is that? And they're like, well, do it every six months and see what it looks like. Or maybe they'll tell you three months. But I would consult with a local professional. They might have even been the one to install the system in the first place. Many people have these businesses for years and then pass them down to people in their family or somebody who buys that business, you know, and they have those records. But they could say, yes, there's filters that should be, you know, sprayed off every so often. Um, and this is how you should spray them off. Spray them off right over the tank usually is the best advice for that because, any microbes, any bacteria, then would and go right back into the tank rather than on your yard or whatever. 
or maybe they're like, um, these inspection ports should be inspected every so often. But again, if you're not comfortable doing that, then that is something that there are businesses that exist to do that. And if you have a system such as a drip system or something that maybe has um, some, sometimes we put aerobic treatment units right into the septic tank to help with breaking down, um, breaking down things. So we can speed up the nitrogen cycle by adding more oxygen into the system. And so, um, which sometimes is a good thing so that we don't put more nitrogen out into our soils in a particular situation. But those are things that are if you're not comfortable maintaining it yourself, or maybe you speak with the way the this uh, person to maintain it and say, can you teach me what are some of the things I can do? What are some of the things that would be better if you do? And you work that out and get into some kind of maintenance contract or maintenance plan for, okay, yep, every, is it once a year or is it once every five years? But get that plan figured out with a real professional in your area because they'll tell you what your system needs. That's great. Yeah, if it's something that needs to happen every six months, like I know I'm supposed to change my air filter um, every six months for my HVAC system, you know, and they tell you do that when you change the time when you spring forward and fall back. So it could be, you know, just have something in your mind um, when you to to trigger you to think about, you know, doing that kind of household chore that doesn't happen all the time, but happens on a regular basis to save you money again, like Deanne said, in the long run, the better you maintain it up front and be proactive, the, the less expensive it will be. If, you know, things will break less often, you can make sure you catch something that could be expensive before it becomes expensive. Just like with the car, just some of that stuff yeah. that's routine maintenance that you do every so often can hopefully avoid some big crisis down the road, some really big expensive crisis. Um, that's that's just the way I think about it. Same with many other things. Our, even our health and our bodies, right? Exactly <laughs> what the right. checkup is for. Exactly right. It really is an annual checkup. And it's, it's not a fun thing. You know, I wouldn't say anybody's like, yay, I'm going to go check my filters or going to go do my routine maintenance. Uh, but today, but it's just part of adulting, right? Part of owning your own home. And that's, you know, I think about that as the, the price of getting to have a beautiful view with wildlife wandering into your yard or things like that. It's where I live. I live in the country. And I know, like, I don't enjoy my time I spend, I think about gardening around my lagoon but it's needed because I'm never again going to have that same problem happen with the, the cattails because that took more Saturdays than I want to admit to, <laughs> to fix. Awesome. Well, Deanne, I just want to thank you so much for spending time with us today talking about wastewater and lagoons and septics. Um, it, it was really great information to, to learn and to be thinking about um, and it really to be proactive about. I think that's my main takeaway is just like, we got to think about it first <laughs> before we do a lot of different things when we start thinking about buying a house, um, building a house, even, you know, while we're in a house, if it has lagoon or septics, um, you know, be sure to keep that at the forefront of our minds. Any final thoughts before we call it a day? Not that I can think of. I just think, you know, arming yourself with information is just the best thing. So if you're listening to this, and you're like, I have no idea. Well, a good person to call and talk to is your county wastewater, your, your environmental professional, or somebody who has a business, you know, a person who installs or maintains systems. If you're like, okay, I got a question <laughs> and they'll be happy to answer it. This is what they do. And they're very knowledgeable. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I want to, again, thank you for everybody's time today and yeah, have a, have a great, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you to all our listeners for tuning into this episode of the EFC Network Podcast, brought to you with support from the U.S. EPA. Be sure to stay tuned for future EFC Network Podcast episodes. 